I am going to read all of 16 and 17. Uh, I think it's important to sort of capture the weight of what uh, Job is feeling in these uh, two chapters here. So Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16, this is God's word. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall windy words have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? I also could speak as you do if you were in my place. I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. I could strengthen you with my mouth, and the solace of my lips would assuage your pain. If I speak, my pain is not assuaged, and if I forbear, how much of it leaves me? Surely now God has worn me out. He has made me desolate. He has made desolate all my company, and he has shriveled me up, which is a witness against me, and my leanness has risen up against me. It testifies to my face. He has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. My adversary sharpens his eyes against me. Men have gaped at me with their mouth. They have struck me insolently on the cheek. They mass themselves together against me. God gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, and he broke me apart. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. He set me up as his target. His archers surround me. He slashes open my kidneys and does not spare. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with breach upon breach. He runs upon me like a warrior. I've sewed sackcloth upon my skin and have laid my strength in the dust. My face is red with weeping and on my eyelids is deep darkness. Although there is no violence in my hands and my prayer is pure. O earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Even now behold my witnesses in heaven and he who testifies for me is on high. My friends scorn me, my eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God, as the Son of Man does with his neighbor. For when a few years have come, I shall go the way from which I shall not return. My spirit is broken. My days are extinct. The graveyard is ready for me. Surely there are mockers about me, and my eye dwells on their provocation. Lay down a pledge for me with you. Who is there who will put up security for me? Since you have closed their hearts to understanding, therefore you will not let them triumph. He who informs against his friends to get a share of their property, the eyes of his children will fail. He has made me a byword of the peoples, and I am one before whom men spit. His, my eye has grown dim from vexation, and all my members are like a shadow. The upright are appalled at this, and the innocent stirs himself up against the godless. Yet the righteous holds to his way, and he who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. But you, come on again, all of you, and I shall not find a wise man among you. My days are past, my plans are broken off, the desires of my heart. They make night into day, the light, they say, is near to the darkness. If I hope for Sheol is my house, if I make my bed in darkness, if I say to the pit, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother, or my sister, where then is my hope? Who will see my hope? Will it go down to the bars of Sheol? Shall we descend together into the dust? Thus far the reading of the word of God, the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we do pray that you would show us what we need to learn from your servant Job, even as he points us to your servant Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Last Sunday, uh, the sort of main thrust of the message was that as Christians, we have the gift of being able to mediate the presence of Christ to one another. Uh, in part as a result of our own suffering. Uh, we are able to go towards one another in, uh, and because of our suffering and minister to one another. And uh, that means that no Christian should ever be alone in their suffering. But you might say, yeah, but I am alone. Well, 
No, you're not. Uh, yeah, but no one knows what I'm going through. Tell someone. And you might say to, about somebody else, well, maybe they are. Maybe, maybe that person there is going through suffering. Well, ask them, are you okay? Or maybe you say, what I'm going through isn't that big a deal. I'm being a baby. Well, maybe small deals become big deals. Maybe you say, well, I can fix this. I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. I've got status and wisdom and knowledge. I have, I have the Holy Spirit. Well, if you could fix this, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die. So stop playing Jesus. Okay, but I'm still alone. Right now I'm alone, and I don't know if or when I'll be able to talk. Okay, fine, we'll start there. And we'll start with Joe, who's alone. Alone and under attack. Maybe you feel like him. Remember, this is a, uh, uh, as I build this, uh, this book here, this is a comedy. Uh, and after the last two chapters, it still becomes difficult to see how in any sense this could possibly be cons uh, considered a comedy. But remember that comedies follow a U-shape. They go down, and then they hit the bottom, and then they go up. And we're very much at the bottom right now. We've been descending all this time down into the depths of despair, down into the pit, down into the grave. And finally, Job just, just he's hit rock bottom. He goes flat and he gives some of the most distressing poetry thus far. He's at the end. He's exhausted. He's been fighting with his comforters. He's exhausted from their assaults and the anguish of his misery. God has worn me out, he says. And in speaking to God, he says, you have desolated. That is, you've destroyed, you've gotten rid of, you've caused those around me to desert me. Some of them with their bodies, some by dying, uh, that, that, that got killed in the tragedy that brought all this on to begin with. But the people that are left are doing the same thing with their words. The people who loved me are dead, and the people who hate me are right here with me, and they won't shut up. They mock me. 17, verse 2. Surely there are mockers about me. You should be better. You used to be better. You were influential. You were fun at parties. You were, uh, uh, you were wise. You gave good advice. What a disaster you are now. And Job says, they mock me, but I can't close my eyes. I want to die. I want to sleep. But I, my eye can't close on their provocation. I'm living this nightmare. They scorn me. They look down on me. 1620. These are my friends. We used to trust each other. We used to help each other. We used to enjoy each other. And now they sneer at me. They make fun of me. They laugh at me. They deride me. They don't have sticks and stones, but their words hurt. Their words are like punches on the face. Have you ever felt that when somebody's insulted you? You feel it physically in your body sometimes. Uh, 1610, he says, uh, uh, men have gaped at me with their mouth. They struck me insolently on the cheek. And it's not just one friend that's doing this. This is a coordinated attack. They mass themselves together against me. They're ganging up on me. Job is alone, and he's under attack. And God? Where is God in all of this? 16.9, he hates me. He has torn me up. His faith, face seethes with hatred toward me. He gnashes his teeth at me. He's given me over to be tortured. He's put me in the hands of wicked men to torment me. Life was good. And he broke me apart. 
He just grabbed me by the neck and he just smashed me to pieces. He sends archers with their arrows and they fire at me and they slash into my kidneys. You know, the kidneys are near your back. When, the, when, when, you're, when something hits you from the back, it means you're running away from them and yet they just keep coming at you. But God just keeps on coming. He won't stop wave upon wave of brutality, of violence, of punishment, of destruction, of anguish. What is to become of me? 1711, my days are past. My plans are broken off. 171, my spirit is broken. He's just exhausted. He's done. My days are extinct. This has to be the end. This has to be all that there, there could possibly be. The graveyard is the only thing that waits for me. There's nothing left. I've got nothing left to lose either outside me or inside me. 1714, my only father is the pit. That's my family now. My mother and my sister are worms. The worms that will eat my rotting corpse. Will my hope die with me? Go into the grave with me? I'm alone and I'm under attack. My friends hate me. God hates me. He's trying to kill me. But he doesn't. There should be some disconnect in Job's mind at this point. Who can kill him? Of all, of all people, who can kill Job? Well, God can. Why doesn't he? Why does he keep tormenting like me like this, but he doesn't kill me? I pointed this out before, but remember that Job does not know the whole story. He doesn't know chapters one and two. He doesn't know the backstory. He doesn't know what happened behind the curtain of heaven. He doesn't know that Satan is the one who hates him and that God is the one who actually loves him. God is the one who said, have you considered my servant Job? My servant, that, those are words reserved for people like David and Moses and Abraham and Jesus. Those are not words that are used uh, randomly in Scripture. No, God loves Job. But Job doesn't know that. God gave Satan permission to torment Job. He said, behold, he is in your hand, and yet don't take his life even though the trial is excruciating. See, God sets the limits of Job's suffering. And it's important to remember this. So that, now with Job, of course, those limits are pretty extreme. I mean, he lost everything he had to lose except for his life. But this, these were the boundaries that he had put on Satan as far as what he could do to Job. And you need to know in your suffering that God sets the limits to it. Satan just does not just have unlimited power and unlimited freedom to do whatever he wants. It is God who sets the boundaries of that suffering. Remember that Satan is a creature. He is not some uncreated being. He is not a competing deity with God. It's not as if there were there is Satan and God, which, which is often what exists in a lot of uh, particularly ancient mythologies. There's these two competing demons or two competing gods that uh, often, uh, and in some of the ancient uh, stories, it's the war between them that ended up creating the earth. Uh, but that, that, that is not what is going on here. Satan is a creature. He was made. He was created. 
God made him. God controls what he does. Now, maybe that scares you to think that God has something to do with your suffering. Wow, this is, this is really bad what I'm going through, or this was really bad that I went through, or, or someday you think, man, this is terrible, and, and God's setting the limits of this. This is up to God to decide. But know that in this broken world, suffering is going to happen no matter what. This is what Satan wants to do. He wants to make people suffer. And he will do that, and he will do it with, uh, uh, with everyone. But God sets the limits. Now, this doesn't mean that you're supposed to be happy that your suffering isn't greater. Well, it could be worse. This is sort of what, that's sort of the thing that the, uh, Job's friends are saying to him, right? Uh, yeah, well, you, you really deserve worse than this. So uh, it's hard to imagine what that would be. But, uh, you know, that's not what's going on here. It doesn't mean that you can tell somebody who's suffering that things could be worse. That's not so bad. You know, your whole life fell apart. It could be worse. What it does mean, though, is that your suffering will not extend so far that God cannot grasp it, that it is outside of his reach or outside of his control, that he is unable to put parameters around what happens there. And that, in fact, you never leave his hand, even though it seems like you have. Even Job did not leave the hand of God. He did not leave the, the sovereignty of God. He was not outside of God's purview of his care. Heidelberg Catechism question 28 uh, says, how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence, that is his care, his providing for all of his creation and his people, how does that help us? We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature will separate us from his love, for all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. So the message is not, as bad as this is, it can always get worse, but rather that as bad as this is, this is exactly as bad as God will let it be. And it will not get worse unless he gives the word, which also means that if God is that specific about the extent of your suffering, then he is just as specific about the remedy and the reward and the purpose of your suffering. Last week I shared that one of the purposes of suffering was to enable you to minister to others. This week, I want to point out another purpose of suffering. It's to complete you. This is why it's helpful to know that God sets the limits of your suffering, because he does have a specific plan for you. And actually, I know what it is. And it's a big surprise here. It's coming at you. You're not going to expect this especially if you've been around for a while, it's to make you like Jesus. I know. Shocking. Usually we think of that in terms of his holiness and his righteousness, and that is true, and yet we will not fully experience that until the new creation. So there is something else that is going on in terms of his making us like Jesus, although he does sanctify us and makes us more and more righteous and holy uh, throughout this life. But there's a goal that he has for you right now, this side of glory, and that is to make you like Jesus in his suffering. Hebrews tells us that he was made like his brothers in every respect. And it also tells us that it was fitting that he should be made perfect through suffering. Perfect doesn't mean that Jesus needed to be made holier. Perfect means that he wouldn't fully enter into humanity unless he suffered. He would not completely accomplish all that he needed to do for humanity unless he suffered. 
So it follows that if you were to be part of that humanity that Jesus entered into, then you must suffer as well. Even Paul talks about filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. So you are united to Jesus in suffering. And those who are united to Jesus in suffering will eventually experience relief from that suffering. As Hebrews goes on to say, Jesus' suffering made him a merciful and faithful high priest, one who is able to understand your suffering as you head for glory, and it is glory to which you are headed. Romans 8.30 you know, it says that the, if you're predestined, if you're one of his chosen ones, you're called. He calls you to himself. And if he calls you, he justifies you. That is, he makes you right before God. And that if, you ju if he justifies you, he will glorify you. And he, Paul tells us this because he's speaking to a people who are going to suffer. And he needs to remind us that the goal of our suffering is glorification, and that as we suffer, we are united to Christ. Even the context of Romans 8, verse 30 that I just uh, mentioned, in, in verse 26, he's talking about how the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That word weakness there is the word asthenia. It actually means sickness. Right before that, he speaks about our groaning as we wait for redemption. The precursor to glorification is suffering. The means by which we get to glorification is union with Christ, and we are united to Christ in his suffering. His suffering ultimately on the cross, but also in undergoing the miseries of this life. That's not the only time Christ suffered was when he was on the cross. He suffered his whole life long. And when we believe in him, we become partakers of the benefits of his sufferings. And as we follow him, we take up our cross and become imitators of his sufferings. He became like us so that we can become like him. And so Jesus says in John 17 that he is glorified in us. And we are glorified in him. And all of this happens not despite suffering, but through it. And by the way, remember, this is any kind of suffering. This isn't limited to just persecution. That is the context of a lot of what is spoken of in the New Testament. But if we're taking cues from Job as to what kind of suffering this entails, uh, uh, Job's suffering was a loss of all kinds of things. Job's suffering was a loss of physical property. It was a loss of community. It was a loss of family. It was a loss of mental health. It was a loss of spiritual health. It was a loss of status, of position, of dignity. He lost all these things, and he doesn't know why. He lost all these things not knowing that God was perfecting his servants bringing him to glory. And also God was setting up Job to be a marvelous signpost of the suffering Savior in the Old Testament. Job doesn't know any of this. But what if he did? What if he knew and he pressed on into the suffering? You know, that would be very difficult to imagine because it would take a far stronger person to be uh, able to do this. And so we find out in Job that, of course, Job wasn't the Savior, but he shows us the Savior. And what's remarkable is that Job didn't know why all this was happening to him, but Jesus knew. Jesus knew who his enemy was. And God said to the enemy, take his life. Jesus knew what put him on the cross. He was torn in God's wrath. He was stricken and smitten and afflicted. His adversaries sharpened their eyes against him. 
They gaped at him with their mouths. <coughs> Excuse me. They struck him on the cheek. They ganged up on him, and he still went. God gave him to the ungodly, and he was taken into the hands of wicked men. His kidneys were slashed open by the whip on his back, and he was given gall to drink, and he still went. He was rushed upon by waves upon waves of anguish, Judas betraying him, Peter denying him, his own people crying out, crucify, and he still went. Job didn't know why he was there. Jesus knew why he was there. He knew why he was there. It was you and it was me. And still he died. He prayed, God, if there's another way, Father, if there's another way. And his father said, no, my son. And Jesus said, okay, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew, but he still said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is alone. But because of that, you are not alone. And yet we find, even in Job, that Job had some sense, some indication, and I don't know where this came from, but he knew he knew somehow that he wasn't alone because Job himself knows that he has a witness in heaven. Job knew he wasn't really alone. He didn't know how, he didn't know who, but he knew someone was his advocate. He knew he had a friend in heaven, someone who could speak on his behalf, someone who loved him. And he didn't know the details, but he knew he had to be equal with God. My eye pours out tears to God and argue the case of a man with God. You hear that? My eye appears to God that God would argue a case, the case of a man with God. He knows that it has to be God who is in heaven who is his witness. He has to argue his case to God. He didn't know the name Jesus, but somehow he knew who Jesus was. And if Job knew him, Job, who lived miles from God's people, miles from the books of Moses, centuries before the reign of Caesar Augustus, you have this book, you live on this land of Jesus, and know that you are not alone. That you have a witness that you have a friend, that you have an advocate, that you have a voice that can speak on your behalf, and you know his name is Jesus. And he knows it all. He knows your deepest, darkest, most twisted thoughts. He knows every aspect of your suffering. He knows every, every facet of your pain. He knows everything. He knows, not just in his mind, but in his body. He has felt the full effect of an evil world in his very flesh. And it was by that, by taking evil on, that he broke its power, not just over himself, but over you. And when he died, he died not merely in his body, but he also died to the world. He died to the flesh. He died to the devil, and you, united to him by faith, have also died to these things. As Paul says in Galatians, I'm crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. So the suffering that you experience now is not taking you from life because you have life in Christ. You have abundant life in Christ. No, it is taking you from the death that this world gives. You are dying to this world. You are seeing that even in the midst of the, the beauty and all the things that we can enjoy that's all around us, ultimately the world can never provide for you what Christ can. 
The end of our time in this world is death. But the moment that we believe in Christ, we have life. A life that the world can never take away. So the secret to suffering is knowing that by it, you are dying to the world. You're being united to Christ more and more, and you're being made alive to God. Job was finding that. He was dying to the world, but he was being made alive to God. He thought God was killing him. He can't be blamed for that. It was his overwhelming belief in the utter sovereignty of God that made him think God was the instigator. But really, it was Satan who was killing him and God who was setting the limits of Satan's power. He doesn't know that God's preservation of his life is evidence of his power over Satan and his ultimate plan to do good to Job to reward him for all he has been through. And he will do this for you as well. That's the question a few weeks ago. Why Job? Why is he going through all of this? Of course, the answer still holds. It's to show us Jesus. To show us a Jesus who sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly strips us of our love for the things of this world, who keeps us from turning even to our friends as the ultimate source of meaning and wisdom and comfort. And he makes us turn our eyes to him as the only source of life, the architect of our salvation, the architect of the new creation to which he is bringing us. You are not alone. If you are alone, you're not alone. If you have no one else on this earth, you do have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have everything. But please do talk to somebody. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are with us, that you are for us. And it was Christ for us on the cross. Christ for us in his resurrection. Christ for us in his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And the Christ continues to plead our case as God speaking to God. Father, we thank you that you have covered us in his righteousness. And that you are detaching us from our love for this world, even in our suffering. And stitching us together, both with one another and with Jesus Christ, as we make our way towards the glorification that you have promised us. Give us patience, Lord, and perseverance, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.